Hello and welcome to another instalment and a very special instalment of History Hack. I have a little bit of a smirk on my face today because we have brought you some pretty mind-blowing episodes in the past. This is, I think, another one. Matt, why am I particularly smug today? Well, we, we're always very proud of our guests, but today we have the best-selling author of more than 30 books, which is like that whole bookshelf over there worth of books, including series such as Eagles of the Empire, well, the Wellington and Napoleon Quartet. The books have been translated over 20 languages, there's millions of them. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome Simon Scarrow to History Hack. Simon, how are you, sir? I'm very well today, thank you. Super. We're, we're really excited about this. And we're going to sort of talk about lots of your books, including the new one, which we'll get to in a bit. Just depends on how, <laughs> how, how many rabbit holes we go down. But it's, yeah, it's a real pleasure to have you with us. We've, we've already been chatting and we've already regretted not hitting record as soon as we started because we'll have to work those gems back in. But um, let's kick this off, really. A question I always love to ask authors, really when you start writing that sort of that spark of inspiration for a historical fiction writer what attracts you to a genre what makes you zero in on something saying yes i want to spend time in that era well it, it, in the case of the, the the roman novels um i was lucky enough to go to a grammar school that still taught um latin and greek um uh, back in the day and i wasn't I'll be honest, I wasn't a particularly good student of the languages and, and um, you know, I, I didn't see a huge amount of relevance for uh, learning these languages in the modern world, if I'm honest. But at the same time, the, the Latin teachers were really, really effective at interesting you in, in, in the wider aspects of Roman culture. So when they started, you know, stopped talking about the, the past pluperfect, whatever, uh, and started talking about Roman plumbing or um, the campaigns of Hannibal or something like this, then the whole thing came alive. And this was at a time when we had um, I, Claudius on television, um, the BBC series, which was <laughs> really pretty gripping and pretty racy stuff for the 70s. Um, I think that's the first time I ever saw a woman's nipple on TV, to be honest. Um, so, you know, quite, quite uh, interesting for a teenage boy. And at the same time on the weekends, of course, you'd have films like Cleopatra, Spartacus, you know, Fall of the Roman Empire, Demetrius and the Gladiators. So there just seemed to be a lot of Roman stuff, you know, about. And then I had um, uh, in the history, when I was doing history A-level, uh, they came up with this optional module, the Cambridge University syllabus came up with this module on Roman Britain. And my history teacher at the time, um, this guy called Jonathan Mills, who, uh, who had been um, teaching me history for, for the previous few years, and he was brilliant. He saw history as a kind of, the way to kind of lure the kids in is to teach it as a soap opera. So, you know, you'd be talking about something and he'd go, and uh, Henry VIII could have married Catherine of Aragon, or we shall find out in the next lesson. So we'd all come piling back the next day, you know, and he was very old school, had us line up and he'd sort of inspect us and uh, before we go into the classroom. And so you know, we were gripped. And then and when you're doing A-level and suddenly it becomes a slightly more serious subject, it's not just about the narrative, it's about assessing the evidence and, and doing research and, and making the case. Um, he was really, really good at make, you know, encouraging you to take that step up. And as I said, we did this Roman Britain thing. And actually Jonathan is the guy I've dedicated the 20th book in the series to. Um, his son got in touch and said, oh, my dad used to teach you history at school. And so that sort of uh, reopened the acquaintance. And um, it's a huge pleasure to be able to express your gratitude to a teacher you haven't seen for you know, nearly 40 years, um, because he's had a big, big influence on me. So uh, a combination of um, great history teaching and uh, an interest in, in Roman culture really got the, uh, the ball rolling. There's not much more of a legacy you can have as a teacher than to inspire somebody to go and write novels that sell in the millions. I mean, talk about a job well done. When it comes to recreating these past worlds, and, you, and you've done it a few with a few different worlds, and we'll, we'll talk about specific examples in a moment. I'm really interested in, in the process because you have a very different job to what myself and Boney do. We, we can just kind of focus on the facts and we relate the facts. You're trying to achieve a very different thing because you need to grip the reader, yet parachute them into a world that feels authentic. So how do you go about that process of translating a historian's 
research into something that has an authentic and engaging feel for the reader? Well, I think it's um, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because uh, you know, essentially, you're writing history, um, but you're writing history in a, in a more speculative manner. So obviously the starting point is, is to go to the, the histor historical works on the, on the era that you're, you're particularly interested in. And that, of course, is a huge amount of pleasure. One of the problems with writing is, is the pleasure of research. Um, you, you know, I can spend months and months and months writing, uh, researching, and then, you know, I'm putting off writing and I'll get a call from the editor who says, um, you know, so Simon, that book you're handing in next month, how's it going? And that usually is the signal to get cracking and um, late nights, peanut butter sandwiches and tenant super kind of see me through. Um, but in terms of getting ready for that, uh, so it, it's it's the, you know, the, the books, you know, the bookcases and so on, you just plow through those. Um, then also there's some quite handy um, reenactor groups around who can give you um, some very, very interesting insights into aspects of maintaining armor, you know, the best way to clean it apparently is to um, use uh, abrasive sand for chain mail, you just put it in there, grind it around a bit and then rinse it out. And that gets rid of the rust much, much better than, you know, anything else. So there, there's some pretty hot tips you can take from that. And you, you know, you lard that into the, uh, into the story to give it that sort of uh, credibility. Um, and then the other big thing, I think, is to make sure that you, if you can, and sometimes, of course, if I'm right, setting a book in the in the Far East, it's slightly, well, Middle East, it's a little bit difficult, get to the place where the, the books are actually set. Now, luckily, I was able to get to the middle of the Jordanian desert and Syria and, uh, uh, to, you know, to research some of the books before all, all that became impossible. So, and I think that's important because um, it's hard to fake the sensation of being in particular places. So for example, in Jordan, if you're standing on top of the, you know, Wadi Araba, um, you know, the, the air is pin sharp because there's no humidity. So you can see clearly, you know, 30, 40 miles away, um, you know, across from a sort of four or 5,000 meters up, you can see that distance very clearly. Um, when you're in Egypt, for example, at nine o'clock in the morning on the banks of the Nile, um, and it starts hitting sort of mid 30 centigrade, um, you know, that is a very particular experience as is, as being, as is being subjected to uh, Nile mosquitoes. And, you know, those buggers are huge, I can tell you, and they're, and they're, and they're relentless. So um, you need to be there really to sort of soak it up and, and to, because when you get back to the word processor, I mean, I, I do take some notes, but, you know, I'm very, very conscious of the environment when I do the research trips and you kind of soak it away in your head. And then it's, it's a case of, I think Stephen King describes it beautifully in his book on writing, that after you start working, after about 10, 15, 20 minutes, he says you begin to see through the page. Um, and like, he's right. There's that sense in which, um, you, you know, yeah, you're, very, you're doing this, you know, tap, 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 tap. But at the same time, you, begin, you can kind of hear, you can kind of smell, you can kind of see um, the environment that you're writing about. And I think when that happens, then that allows you to, as you say, you know, parachute into this, this alien world with a degree of credibility and to make it uh, available to the reader. And of course, what we mustn't forget in this process is that I'm only doing half the work here. Um, you know, you, it is black marks on white paper at the end of the day and the reader, you know, and what you have to do is make it easy for the reader to translate those into something that is as real to them as it was to me when I put the words down. And I think that's really the heart of the craft. So do you find yourself kind of, before you start this process, envisaging certain scenarios, I would like to put person X in situation Y, and then you go to these places and go, this really isn't gonna work. I'm gonna to have to stick that idea in the bin and actually spin this very differently. Um, that happens sometimes, but it's called historical fiction for a reason. Um, and, um, you know, Sometimes the story, you know, you have to sort of bend the facts to, to make the story work. Um, and then you end up to it in the author's note at the end. A case in point would be when I was writing about Napoleon, because when he was um, a young officer, um, he seemed to spend rather more of his time in Corsica on holiday than he did serving in the French army. And he took, um, you know, something like a, a dozen trips between France and Corsica. And I thought, well, if I, you know, make it that way in the book, um, it's going to be more travelogue than, than an exciting novel. So I boiled it down to basically three trips um, and owned up to that fact in the author's note. And I think sometimes, you know, you have to do that because um, 
I'm not writing, you know, pure history. What I'm writing, um, what I would, you know, my goal as a historical novelist is to get people interested in history, to get them to understand why I'm so fascinated in a particular character or an event or you know, a particular setting. Um, and that's the primary purpose. And that, that means I have to kind of bend things a little in order to get them there, um, rather than put them off, which is would be very, very easy to do if I sort of mentioned all 12 of those trips. Um, then you know, that that's kind of what you, that's the, one of the compromises you have to make. And of course, there are many compromises in writing historical fiction, um, and also to a degree in, in writing straight history. Um, you know, particularly if you're writing, uh, you know, a historian writing some sort of hagiographic account of Cromwell or something like that. Um, you know, you'll throw in a few warts, but it's mostly going to be hagiography, let's face it, because you're a fan of Cromwell. Um, and it's the same thing with, with historical fiction. You know, you want your readers to identify with your characters. That means that there are going to have to be some sort of anachronisms there because, you know, the Romans were fairly brutal and unpleasant people. You know, that's, that's the nuts and bolts of it. And if we were to try and accurately reproduce them as far as we can, which would be a very, very rough guess in any case, um, even if we were to go halfway down that track and approach some semblance of um, verisimilitude, uh, the reality would be that you know most readers will think, oh, no way am I, you know, Macron Cato, no way, you know, these are not people I would drink in a pub with, you know, because I'd probably get glassed uh, by Macro, and um, you know Cato would, um, you know, if, if he was realistic, would sort of have some very very uh, unpolit you know, unacceptable political views and so on. So um, you know. You, you have to make that, that's one of the compromises you also have to make in translating history into historical fiction for a readership that will actually accept um, that version of events. And of course, you're going to have, uh, maybe you, you know, there's a, a question to do with, you know, what happens when you, you do get it wrong and you get some anorak turn up to uh, tell you something. Um, and that happens surprisingly rarely, um, which I'm, I'm relieved to say. Um, but when it does happen, you know, sometimes um, it's, a, it's a, I have to say, it's one of the pleasures of writing is slapping them down. Let, let's, let's jump to the con contemporary, really, because you, you, you've, you've not just stuck to, to Rome, which we'll be talking mm. about then. But when, when you're writing an FBI thriller, like, you know, playing, um, playing with death, how, how, how does your mindset change? Or, or is it the same sort of skills? Because you're sort of, you're not immersed in a historical world you're in a very real one where maybe yeah. your constraints are slightly different well that that's uh that's you know it's interesting you bring that one up actually i mean that's one of the I'm, one of the books i'm most proud of um but you know which sold very very you know few copies because i think the publisher basically was trying to sort of say oh people who are interested in rome will of course be interested in uh, in something set in the near future about artificial intelligence and virtual reality it's a no-brainer and um, unfortunately, that marketing ploy didn't really work for some reason. I, who knows? Um, but anyway, playing with death was actually an idea. The idea I had for that, I had about five years be before I even thought about writing for ancient Rome, um, because I'd read something in the Sunday Times about um, uh, the Internet and you know, the early days of the Internet. And within five years, the porn industry, the online porn industry, was worth more to the American economy than the car industry. And that fact really kind of shocked me. And I thought, you know, and at the same time, I was thinking about, you know, virtual reality, because I think Tron had come out or something like that. And, um, uh, you know, I'd seen a few years before. And I thought, well, you know, if we get decent VR, one of the very, very first applications um, will be sex and, you know, and pornography. Um, and then, of course, if when artificial intelligence comes along. And so I came up with this idea and I thought, well, you know, what could be better for your, you know, anorak wearing sexual pervert than VR with AI? So that, you know, if you were, it felt like you were really abusing somebody rather than just some sort of avatar. So that became the basis of this um, um, detective novel set in um, California. Um, and originally it was set actually in, in, in Britain and it was going to be a radio play. But then when I was talking about it with my, one of my former students, Lee, uh, Francis, who I co-wrote the book with, who'd worked in the film industry. And he said, no, no, this, this is this one. We originally developed it as a TV series, um, but that takes forever. So I said to him, look, why don't we write it as a novel um, whilst we're waiting for the TV series to come off? And um, even if it doesn't, then we can always sell the rights for the novel. Then we can get sold, you know, be paid for writing the script so we can get paid three times instead of two. 
So, um, you know, that's, that's why we did it. And it was a real interesting exercise um, working, co-writing uh, for the first, I'd already done a bit of co-writing with Tim Andrews for some Roman projects. Um, and that worked really well. So I was kind of less prejudiced against the idea of, of working with Lee because he's quite a bit younger and he comes from a film background. So it's all about dialogue with him. Um, you know, his idea of writing uh, a story is, you know, uh, day, nine o'clock, setting this, then straight, straight into the dialogue. I said, well, Lee, that's not how we do it as writers. You know, we, we have to do the, you know, the scene setting. So, but his, his um, dialogue was really, really crisp. So we worked on that together and, you know, we were dealing with some pretty, I don't know if, you know, if you, if you haven't read it, I would recommend it because it's a real kind of water cooler of the moment kind of novel. Um, and, you know, all the, and we, we worked with an FBI guy because um, the, the, the person who's the heroine of the story uh, is an FBI agent. And, um, you know, you, unfortunately you can't credit them. That's the deal. They will help you but you can't name the individual who helped you in the acknowledgements. And this guy was very, very helpful. And at the end, when we sent him a copy, he said, you know, it's the most accurate um, version of uh, an, you know, a novel starring FBI people that he's ever read. So I thought, yeah, we got that right. Um, and it was just, I, I just don't understand why it didn't sort of succeed. Um, you know, we, we did it, ticked all the right boxes. Um, and it was, you know, a very very different prospect from writing anything um, historical, uh, but at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm like anybody else, I'm, yeah, I'm interested in history. I'm interested in the whole span of history, but I'm equally interested in what's going to happen, um, and I'm very much into sort of science fiction and futurology and so on, and um, I'm very concerned also in the way that I mean, you can, you know, we look at VR, we look at AI, we look at um, the ways those things are exploited by corporations and, and multinationals and so on and it's not like there isn't a precedent for that in history so it, it's quite clear to see the way that certain things will, will will turn out and of course you know somebody comes up with um uh the internet and uh, so the the porn industry leaps on board and of course they're the people that pioneered credit card payment they're the people that pioneered jp jpegs and so on and the uh, first video um, um sharing facilities and so on. So all of that was driven by the porn industry. So, you know, we, we you know, which tends to be forgotten when people talk about uh, the origins of the internet and how it's developed, you know, all these things you're thinking, yeah, but it's all basically down to, you know, these pervy little anorak guys who came up with the technology to exploit other pervy little anorak guys. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's what we were kind of, Lee and I were trying to, you know, be a little bit warning about, you know, what happens when, um, you blend AI and VR um, in in a kind of the context of sexual exploitation. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's worrying stuff. I can remember the days when I was given geography projects at secondary school uh, on the, the south coast of France, and you'd type words like Nice Beach into a Google search function, and you'd get very different results. So what you were anticipating as an eleven-year-old trying to do their geography homework. Um, mm. Well, I was, uh, I'll tell you something. When I was teaching, one of the guys in the English department uh, was doing something on um, Louisa Alcott. So um, he typed in little women. And the next thing we know, the IT department, you know, watchdogs are kicking down the door and saying, what the fuck are you searching for? <laughs> can I stay with that co-authoring well, Can thing? I just say, you're making me feel old that you had Google at secondary school. Uh, we, we had this sorry. big box in the corner of the room with like a green screen that's a yeah see we're, we're a mix of ages here on history hack you're wearing it well bony wearing <laughs> it well let me stay with the the co-authoring thing a moment because i'm i'm again i kind of approach this from a history perspective and i in a, an alternative universe where myself and matt sit down to write something about napoleon for example for me that would be an absolute nightmare partly because i'm a control freak let's be honest but also historians have a different way of doing these things because we tend to carve it up and sort of say, you do that bit, I'll do this. And then we never kind of go through the process of smoothing over the ripples and getting the tone consistent. You can't do that. You, you have to keep the tone consistent because you've got paying mm. guests, if you will. You know, you've got people who are, who are paying their money to, to have that consistency of tone. And if you chop and change, it doesn't work. So how do you deal with the fact that you've got something that's sort of your baby but it's also somebody else's baby and you've got to work with this sort of other person who's in the room 
Well, you know, there's no guarantee it will work. Um, that, that, that's always the thing. And this, you know, these aren't the first two people I've, I've worked with on, on projects. I've, I've, you know, I've worked also with my younger brother on a, a film script a few years ago, and that was okay. But where it works, it seems to be the case that, um, you know, you have to be, find someone that you, you have sort of a, a similar view of things with. That helps a big deal. Um, but then in the process of writing, what tends to happen is like, you know, I write, say, the first 10,000 words. Then they go over to um, TJ Andrews or to Lee, and then they will sort of like edit that. They will add a bit, then they'll add their 10,000 words and send it back. Now, I will see what they've changed and I'll think, oh, actually, you know, he's right. That actually makes a, you know, that's better if we do it that way. And that's more often the case than not. And it's the same thing with them because, you know, then I will edit some of their stuff and so it goes back. So what you're getting is this process of perpetual kind of refinement between people who think along the, on the same way, wavelength. And it actually works quite well. And it's exciting as well because, you know, quite often they'll come back to something and they'll have changed something and you'll think, of course, yeah, that's what he could have done. That's what he should have done. And so you, you go with that and then you see something that they offer and you think, yeah, yeah, but what if we did this? And then, you know, you add that into the mix. And so there is this lovely kind of... Um, you know, spiral of constantly improving, and and, it, and the story doesn't necessarily, you know, turn out the way you, you originally thought it was going to go, and that's also an you know an added pleasure to the process because, um, you know, in a way, that's kind of how I work anyway. I only write. Uh, Wellington Pelling was different because you know, big historical characters, loads of stuff, and you have to stick with uh, a certain sort of outline. But with Macro and Cato, you know, frequently I don't know how the story is going to end. I mean, I know where it's stuck, where it's set because I've been somewhere and I thought, yeah, that's really good, or I've read something, I think that would be a good basis for a story. Um, and, um, you know, I know, you know, obviously who the hero is going to be, and I know who the antagonist is going to be, and what the problem will be. But the, the synopsis for the novels, Macro and Cato novels, is never more than half a side of A4, um, because I want to find out, you know, what's going to happen in the course of writing the novel. You know, and it's the same thing to a degree with the, um, uh, the German series that I'm writing as well. You know, I, I knew what was going on. I knew who the ultimate, you know, villain was going to be, but everything in between, you know, was up for grabs. And um, and, you, and you can always do that thing that Raymond Chandler said. You know, if you, if you find the pace of the story is going a bit slow, have some guy walk into the room with a gun. You know, <laughs> works for me. <laughs> I, I I I love I love that line. It's because in his books you can tell when he's run out of pace because literally happens every other book doesn't it in, in Chandler's mind anyways we, we digress we'll come back to him in a minute I think um let's start talking about some of this the specific series here the Wellington and Napoleon series in, in honor of, of Zach who I have sitting on the screen below me um you started these in the, in the mid 2000s what's that I, I guess really that sort of what prompted you to make that switch from from Rome to the Napoleonic era and um, start diving into the lives of these rather similar yet rather different people that we think we know so much about. Well, that um, that came out as a, as a result of a, um, a visiting lecturer who came to the uh, University of East Anglia once and to talk about the French Revolution. And um, it was really an interesting talk. And then, um, Somebody said at the end, they are, when it came to questions, somebody asked and said, you know, so, you know, all, all of that aside, what do, um, do you think the main consequences of the, the French Revolution were? And this guy said, well, I think it's a bit too early to say. And I thought, wow, you know, that's really, really fascinating. Um, a perspective, you know, very long view you're, you're taking there, mate. And, and of course, it's true. I mean, the French Revolution changed everything. Um, it killed the idea of divine right of kings quite effectively for a lot of European nations. Um, and I thought, well, you know, this is, this is, I think it's, you know, actually the, probably the most important historical event of the last 200, 200 and a bit now, um, years, um, because it changed it's so many things. It was the culmination of a whole process of, um, uh, you know, iconoclastic thinking and, and in terms of science, in terms of politics, in terms of philosophy, in terms of art. All of that was happening at the same time. Um, and then you have this major political upheaval where, you know, th there's an attempt to kind of almost like rebuild France from the ground up with, its, with a new calendar, new sort of 
religion, all, all these sorts of things were going on. And, um, and I thought, well, this, this is kind of pretty cataclysmic. And on the one hand, you have France, and on the other hand, you have this kind of stuck in its kind of rut Britain. Um, and how do you kind of uh, write a narrative that embraces both of those perspectives? And then, of course, you discover that Wellington and Napoleon are born in the same year. They're both born on, on, to, in islands, you know, on the uh, provincial islands, um, to very, very minor aristocracy in, in Napoleon's case, but minor aristocracy in, in Wellington's case. Um, and, you know, you wonder um, to, to the degree to what, what would have happened to both of them if, if the French Revolution hadn't have happened. You know, so it becomes the making of them. And, and in turn, of course, they become the making of, of subsequent events. So I thought that it would be a, a really, really interesting way to kind of explain the process through these two leading individuals. Now, you know, obviously, you know, Wellington's much less of a leading individual than Napoleon. But ultimately, you know, he's the guy that puts the, the seal to Napoleon's career in, in, in many ways, of course. I mean, it's not just that he beat him at Waterloo um, with a little help from the Prussians. Um, it's also that, you know, he, he basically caned French interest in, in um, Spain pretty substantially and invaded the south of France. So it's, you know, a lot of, of the reason why um, Napoleon fell is down to the way that uh, Wellington, you know, uh, campaigned and also he he did it you know, in, with a very kind of uh, modern perspective in terms of you know he didn't just see himself as the general of the troops he saw himself as a kind of roving ambassador for and foreign secretary making policy on the hoof on the ground as it were and of course you know that and the fact that he became a major statesman afterwards, I think, you know, is perfectly you know, understandable given his political skills. And not only is he sort of doing that role, he's also having to play the part of a very, very political general because he's got a troublesome older brother who's making, you know, waves in London. And he's got a, quite a few subordinates who have powerful political connections who he has to be very, very careful about, you know, in terms of disciplining them. And boy, did they need some disciplining in some cases. And of course, he's the guy that's in charge of the, the largest field army in the British Army, a bit like um, Jellicoe at Jutland. You know, he's the guy that could have lost the war in an afternoon um, just as easily. So he's got to balance all those sort of things. So, you know, it's funny, you know, as I started this series out, because, you know, being a, a slightly left of centre, you know, my sympathies were initially with Napoleon, who I thought was, you know, this kind of self-made man who was utterly brilliant. I mean, I had no doubt about that. You know, he was a first-rate intellect, but he was a man with no moral center. And that became increasingly, you know, um, understandable as, as the thing went on. Um, with Wellington, you know, it was quite funny that I, um, I didn't really like him, you know, cold, aloof, crusty aristocrat, and he was, you know, I didn't particularly warm to him. But in the course of writing the novels, and you, you do the research and you find out you know, some aspects of the man's character, you think, no, you know, this, this much as I don't like his politics, you know, I utterly admire him for, you know, the way he does things. A case in point would be, he um, sent out some junior officer to go and buy some cattle um, from, a, I think it was a Portuguese um, landowner for, for the army rations. And the kind guy came back empty handed and Wellington said um, in the evening, you know, what the hell happened? And, and the guy said, well, he, he demanded that I, I sort of go down on, on my knee and beg for the right to buy the cattle. And I said to him, no British officer is going to bloody well do that, some bloody Portuguese person. So anyway, but Wellington then got on his horse, rode to this guy's farm, you know, estate, went down his knee and got the cattle. Now, you know, that says a lot about a man um, in, in that kind of position, that he, you know, he sublimates everything to the, the cause. Um, you know, it's all about his particular vision and, and anything goes. And you just couldn't imagine half the, the officers in the British Army, you know, even contemplating doing anything like that. You still can't, frankly. You know, a lot of them today are, are completely stuck up their own asses. Um, there's a lovely book by Simon Ackham that came out um, a few months ago called um, The Changing of the Guard about the British Army since 9-11. Um, and when you read that, it's pretty bloody sobering stuff about just how wrong-headed the senior ranks of the British Army still are to this day. What I really like about that, and the, poke, the people who are listening to this won't have known, but as you were talking about Napoleon and kind of your transition in thinking about both Napoleon and Wellington, 
I was just giving you the thumbs up the whole way because you've just kind of explained everything that I tried to talk to people about. Um, well, so there is that story about Napoleon that um, when he was talking about defending Paris and he said, you know, I don't care if Paris is, you know, uh, shelled into the sort of Stone Age sort of thing, you know, we will not surrender to, you're thinking, that sounds rather like a sort of more recent dictator uh, and Berlin, frankly. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, the more I read about it, the more... And of course, the other thing that... Um, sorry, I just mentioned this, because I just think it's one of the okay. fascinating aspects of history, is that, um, you know, I write about these two guys, and they're there from the start right through to, the, you know, to Waterloo. But the thing is that there were three occasions when um, Wellington should have gone on a ship to travel somewhere, but was too ill, and the ships foundered and everybody went down on them, um, you know, a few days after leaving port. There were several occasions where, you know, Napoleon was wounded in the thigh by a bayonet in Toulon. And then there was, no, um, you know, there are numerous sort of shells exploding by him. And there was one instance, I mean, again, you know, luck, but also, again, this thing about the, the minds of these people. Um, in 1814, there was a, a mortar shell that was fired near him uh, in front of a, a rank of his soldiers. And he, you know, it was going to go off in about sort of, you know, in the next few seconds. And he knew exactly what to do. So he rode his horse over the top of the, the, the mortar shell. So it took the full blast. It was killed outright and, you know, dropped dead underneath him. But, you know, he'd saved a good 20 of his men and possibly his own life. But he knew, you know, what to do in the most ruthless possible fashion in that fraction of a second. And I think it's, it's that kind of um, luck, but at the same time, you know, the, the ability to instantly grasp the opportunity or uh, the need for what needs to be done. Um, and that's what sort of characterised, I think, both Wellington and Napoleon. Uh, you, you're preaching to the choir here, as you know, but Matt will be yeah. hugely <laughs> relieved to know that I'm not about to spend the next three hours discussing the Napoleonic era with you. But I do want to stay with the whole Wellington-Napoleon dynamic for a minute, because one thing that I particularly like about the way in which you tell that story is the way you cut between the two perspectives. Mm -hmm. But to do that, you've got to do something that's incredibly challenging to people who spend their entire lives studying one of these people, which is to get inside their head. So how do you go about that process of trying to be in someone's mind and kind of see through their eyes? Because you're, you are writing as Wellington, you write as Napoleon in the course of these novels. How do you kind of achieve that mindset to be able to then portray them on the page? Well, I mean, obviously, you read a lot of biographies um, and you try and read a range of biographies as well. I mean, one of the things I, you know, if I'd known before I'd started, I don't think I'd have you know, done the project. Um, you know, I, I, I pitched it to the publisher. We got the contract. I, I started work. And then, of course, I discovered that there are over 100,000 biographies of Napoleon. You know, and you think, well, I'm not going to read all of those. Um, and then, but the thing is, you, you get, there's a whole range of them. So the, you know, there were, um, there's the sort of standard kind of biographies. And then there's a whole raft of them of people who served with him. So there's one from one of his cooks, there's one of his butlers. And, you know, once you start peeling away, you know, th these kinds of um, uh, biographies, you get some very, very interesting insights, you know, some sort of ticks of the character. And once you sort of look at these as symptoms of, a, of, of a, an internal process, then you begin to think, okay, well, you know, there's enough consistency here in, in the way that he responds to this. You think, okay, well, why does he respond the way he does? And of course, you know, that's where you part company from um, uh, proper historians, if you would call them that, like yourself. Um, and, you know, you, be, you have to kind of, you're making educated guesses. I mean, that, that actually, that's what hi, proper historians do. But I think, you know, with historical fiction, um, you're making, uh, you're just pushing that envelope slightly further because you're going inside the thought processes and you're thinking, okay, best guess, this is kind of why they did, they, they were motivated to do this particular thing. This is why they reacted in this particular way. Um, and, and that's how you kind of go about it. Um, and of course, you know, the, the reality is that um, there are probably as many different versions of Napoleon and Wellington as there are people who, you know, who are interested in the subject or even read the books. Um, and that, that is always the case. I mean, that is, the, you know, the, the thing about the printed word is that why it's so powerful is that um, everybody's reading of one of my novels is unique. You know, if they were to make it into a film, it would be the same film for everybody. And I think, um, you know, that that's kind of 
that's one of the reasons why I like you know, history so much is that you know there is this tendency to try and treat it as monolithic but it isn't it's it's this vastly atomized thing through which people attempt to draw things together to make narratives and that's as good as it gets but you know and you know, that means we're, we're always going to be in work and there will always be stories to tell. Just on that point of, of drawing the narrative, you've got a very defined journey for your, your two characters. We'll call them characters here because they are. They're your books. You're doing what you want with them. But unlike your sort of half side of A4 for, for Maka and Keita, when you've got very well-known journeys for your two characters does that limit you in a way or like you said do you try to just get in their head more to to sort of take that you know you can't take you know wellington off to america for example if even if you have a really good idea for it that's that's a different type of what sort of wellington the hollywood years that that novel. yes you know yeah okay yeah. Like, yeah, like the, the the book of mormon only with wellington showing up for for three days for something important oh. mm. Um, well, you know, it's different, isn't it? I mean, if you're writing about Macron and Cato, you're writing about fictional characters against a historical background, a huge amount of latitude. If you're writing about Wellington and Napoleon, as you say, you know, you are constrained by very, very well-known facts and timelines. Um, there is a degree, as, as we've talked about with, you know, him flitting to and fro from Corsica, um, Napoleon, that um, you can, you can uh, edit things down, boil things down, distill things a bit. Um, but ultimately, you are confined by the facts. Um, there are, you know, I mean, I did invent a few episodes, you know, for example, when they meet, um, because they, they were both in France when they were young men. Uh, Wellington was at um, an academy, um, some sort of riding school for aristocrats who were a bit dim, uh, that, you know, that we specialise in Britain. And he'd been sent to France to get a bit of an education in riding and, and sort of military things. And at the same time that Napoleon was at the military school in France. And I thought, well, you know, okay, I'm sure they would have sort of social and, you know, uh, things. So I contrived this meeting as young men, which would be really interesting. And then one last time after Waterloo, um, when, you know, Wellington, you know, is secretly sort of taken to meet Napoleon, you know, to discuss terms of surrender and then realises he's, he's never going to give in. Um, and I just wanted that as, as kind of the, to bookend that, that relationship, because, you know, apart from that, they never met, you know, apart from sort of watching each other through telescopes at Waterloo. Uh, and that was about it. Can I ask about a, a very different setting now, which is about Blackout, which is mm -hmm. a book that came out earlier this year. It's, it feels like, I, from what you've said already, I gathered that it is going to be part of another great series. It's set in Berlin during the Second World War. And as soon as I heard about this and your publicist got in touch with us, I kind of sat there and thought, this is bold for, you know, really obvious reasons in terms of setting. So why pick wartime Berlin as a location? Th this actually came out of um, an idea I had for a one-off novel I was going to write about a, a serial killer in, in Alderney during the Second World War, because it's the, the you know, at the time, most, there are only something like 20 British people who, uh, well, Alderney people, who stayed on the island during the war, the rest were evacuated. Uh, when the Germans turned up, but it was also the only place in on British Isles that we had a concentration camp, and um, there was something like five, six out five six thousand workers toiling away on Alderney to turn it into a fortress. And um, I thought it's an island, three and a half miles long, mile and a half wide, you know, perfect ground for a serial killer and, and a confined kind of story. And you know, and then it occurred to me that the um, German police officer who would be sent to investigate this from Berlin. Uh, would have had to have done something really, really awful to be sent to Alderney, because that's the kind of place it was. You know, if you committed some kind of sin, you'd get sent to Alderney, because it's the most boring posting in the Reich. And um, so then I thought, well, I've got to find out what he did in Berlin that was so wrong that would, you know, get him sent there. So that, of course, leads into the researching into Berlin police in, in wartime years. And that became a real... Um, rather a long journey because there's just so much good material and I was working my way back you know I thought well no no if okay I, I need to know this guy's entire career so um then it occurred to me well you know if I'm going to do that I'm going to have to write the pre-novel where we cover the reasons why he's sent there and then of course as soon as you think that you think well there's a series here but where do we start it and I thought well why not at you know the beginning of the of the war because it's a really really fascinating moment um for a number of reasons firstly uh so it's you know, the, the end of 1939 and the winter into 1940, uh, certainly that's where the first two novels are. First novel is Black Christmas. Um, and, um, you know, the war's been declared, Poland's been defeated, 
Um, and so there's a feeling that the war's over because you know France and uh, Britain, why will they continue to fight? Poland doesn't exist anymore. There's no reason. So they were fully expecting you know, peace in the spring. And so there was this real unreal ambience uh, about the capital. And then, of course, you've got the worst winter uh, for living, you know, in living memory, where temperatures didn't get above zero until March. Um, and it got down to sort of minus 20 in Berlin on a regular basis. So you've got this absolutely horrific winter, coal shortages, rationing. And then added on top of that, of course, you've got the blackout itself, which the Germans put in place very, very strictly right from the off. And almost immediately, um, deaths from road accidents and uh, accident, you know, other kind of accidents shot up, so as did crime, as did prostitution. Um, and, and it changed behaviours, so people were a lot more uh, willing to sort of, you know, have uh, affairs and um, do, you know, to listen to sort of jazz music and to do all sorts of things that they couldn't do quite so openly um, before. So there was this very, very strange kind of ambience. And then I came across this sort of reference, but it, I mean, it actually happened in 1940 and 41, this guy who was killing people um, on the uh, railway system. And so I thought, okay, well, that's his first case, because I thought this is really, really interesting. Um, and it fits beautifully with the whole kind of blackout setting. And, uh, and we'll go from there. And part of the reason I, you know, I, I got interested in this is just because the absolute, absolutely monumental mindfuck that is Nazi Germany in, in so many ways, you know, it isn't just that they're a bunch of, you know, Hugo Boss uniform wearing, you know, goose steppers or anything like that. It's more to do with the fact that, you know, it, it's the way that they completely transform the way um, an educated, highly developed society operated within the space of a few years um, and turned it into this kind of self-policing police state in, in many ways. Um, and it's also the, the, the absolutely uncompromising nature of their ideology. So that, for example, they refused to accept that Einstein was right because he was Jewish. And what Germany needed was Aryan physics. You know, like race, like science kind of goes, yeah, well, it's of course it's different for Aryans, you know. And it's the same thing with Aryan art and Aryan science, and Aryan medicine, you know. And they were really, really big on, for example, homeopathy. And it's the Nazis that kind of insisted that, you know, there was an equivalence between quack doctors and real doctors. So you, you've got a lot of all this sort of thing going on. Um, and the book I'm writing now, the, the follow up to it is about um, the Action T4 programme, which is basically the way the, the means by which they started secretly euthanizing uh, mentally and physically handicapped children. And then, of course, you discover and you're doing the research on this. But yeah, the Nazis, you know, gassed and they, you know, they start, the first people they gassed were the kids, um, you know, um, that they gassed 20,000 of these German kids in, in the course of the war. Um, but until 1960, Sweden euthanized 60,000 kids. Who knew? What about Denmark? So, you know, similar sorts of policies were going on in Denmark, Norway, the USA. And of course, the Nazis become the repository of all evil. But the reality is anti-Semitism was rife across Europe and America. Um, you know, these sorts of um, neo-Darwinist ideas of, you know, the purity of the race and things like that were very, very popular in all sorts of countries. And yet, you know, we, we've kind of created Nazi Germany as this, this, as I say, this repository for evil, you know, so that we can project, 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 you know, all the crap that we were up to. Shocking. So, I mean, it's, it's an absolutely fascinating era you know, for all those sorts of reasons. And then, of course, you've got the parallels of the modern world, where you look at um, you know, some of the, uh, uh, I mean, you, God almighty, when you're reading um, Hitler and Goebbels on propaganda, it's almost like you're looking over Nigel Farage's shoulder sometimes, or him and Boris Johnson, you know, you, you know always, always, always underestimate the mind of the voter, only give them three word slogans and repeat them very often, get Brexit done, you know, um, don't elect Corbyn, keep foreigners out, you know, this sort of thing goes a hell of a lot further than, you know, the, the left's, well, of course, we have to understand this is a very complex issue. Now, if you'll sit down and you'll give me three hours, I'll tell you why. You know, and it, it's, I, was, I was thinking about this the other day, actually, you know, politics is like a song. You know, I was, I was singing in the car on the way to Norwich the other day. And it was one of those songs where, you know, you're, you join in with the chorus because, you know, the chorus. And the rest of the song, you go, la, 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 la. It's a bit like, you know, singing the Welsh National Anthem. 
so um you know you you do you kind of they're in the car and that's what's going and i thought yeah you know what the right does is they they sing the chorus the left always sings the verses that's why they lose <laughs> So yeah, I'm in blackout, um, you know, constantly. Or as I'm writing it, you know, something comes up in the news, and I'm thinking, oh no, here we go again. I want to ask about something that you were talking about in terms of that. I don't want to use the word culture because that's completely the wrong kind of connotation to this, but that that sort of sense of uneasiness that kind of ripples all the way through the novel, in terms of the the fear and your protagonist kind of not knowing who he can trust in the slightest and being really concerned about what other people are saying and the impact that that might have on them. And it's part of this kind of thing about navigating the complexities of writing a novel that set it in the Third Reich. And the, the choice of character struck me is really interesting here because of the way that they're trying to deal with these issues. So what, what was it that made you think inspector of police was that just because initially you wanted to write a, a crime novel and and so you know automatically you wouldn't go that way or was this kind of a, a conscious decision about if i want to write uh, a hero into this novel i need somebody who's not going to be an Aryan sob yeah well yeah, it was going to be a crime novel so we you know the hero had to be something to do with the police or a detective or something like that that, that was a given but you know, more importantly, you know, and and what kind of has all the you know the shimmering between the past and the present going on, you know, is someone who you know believes in the rule of law in a society run by people who don't, you know, someone who believes in the authority of knowledge and fact and evidence in a society where that is is kind of immaterial, you know, what counts is you know who's loudest, not who's wisest, and of course, you know, in the age of Trump. In the age of Johnson, in the age of Farage, in the age of Facebook and social media, you know, we're, we're kind of scratching the same ground again, aren't we? You know, and, and that's what kind of struck me. And that's why, you know, at the end of the novel, um, when he goes to see Heydrich and he, you know, they've solved the crime, they know who the killer is. And um, he's, you know, he's saying, we were, you know, we need to tell people about this and we need to tell the families, you know, we need to be, have this on record. And Heydrich says, you know, who do you think you are? You don't own the truth anymore, we do. And that of course is, you know, the kind of world that we're living in now, because, you know, um, you can, you can you know, we saw this with the last election after the, the, the near run um, in 2017 thing where Corbyn, you know, you know, broke the records in terms of achieving a political swing and became a very, you know, real danger to the conservative establishment. They went for him all guns blazing and came up with all sorts of smears and lies and things like that. And they, you know, the thing is, you know, what works these days, you know, knowledge, you know, what, what passes for knowledge seems to be that thing which gets uh, recycled with the greatest velocity, rather than that thing which, you know, has the greatest verisimilitude, you know, and that is the nature of the world in which we live. And, you know, this is very much part and parcel of the way that the you know, life was under Nazi Germany. You know, facts no longer mattered. What mattered was, you know, being on message. Um, and, you know, and it's slightly more complicated than that as, as well, because, you know, there is a temptation to think about Nazi Germany as this, ah, yes, the trains ran on time and it was ruthlessly efficient and that's what the Germans are like and so on. And, and the reality was that it was anything but that. It was you know, a society written by political factions. Um, who were trying to second guess what the Führer would, how the Führer would react. There's a lovely German phrase, which I can't remember the German for, but basically the British translation is, you know, obeying orders before they are given. So this is, you know, what seemed to be driving the, the Nazi bureaucracy, you know, trying to anticipate how Hitler would react to the policy that they, you know, and then, you know, framing the policy in those terms. So it's quite credible, for example, that, you know, Hitler didn't necessarily envisage, you know, concentration camps, but it was kind of delivered because they knew that that's actually what they thought he wanted, you know, um, and that's what was kind of the, the, the driving animus for, you know, people like Heydrich and Himmler and so on. Yeah, you know, that, that, that's how it is. And you begin to wonder, you know, with, uh, uh, hit, you know, with leaders like Trump and, and to a lesser extent Johnson, you know, how much of policy you know, is made up by their underlings um, you know, with a view to how Trump's going to react or how Johnson's going to react to something. Um, and, and you get that sort of sense that there's a lot of um, freelancing going on uh, lower down the ranks, you know, by you know, Kushner in, in, in say, uh, America. And over here, you've got, you know, the, with the likes of Gove and uh, 
um, to a lesser extent, people like, uh, I have to say lesser extent, because you kind of look at Rob, you think, man, hasn't got a brain cell in his body. You know, he just seems to be you know, moving from one cock up of an interview to the next. But um, I'm sure there, there are some people in the, in the Tory party who actually know what they're about, possibly Mog. Um, it's a bit hard, really. To... Actually, he kind of, you know, you, you look at Mog and you think, there's something eerily 30s and Teutonic about his hairstyle, isn't there? That sort of and shade. The cut, of his, and the cut of his suits as well. Yeah, he's absolutely. He's a breasted man, is he? Can you trust yeah, him? Yeah, that's right. Suit? He's not the sort of member for the, you know, what they say, the you know, 1870s, the member for the 1940s, I think. <laughs> just before we, we we move on to the new book i've got a couple, couple of bits about blackout first, first off you've given shank a great backstory with motor racing so i adore the motor racing 30s the the, the complexities the politics of it you know, nuvolari dick seaman all, all, all of those guys is it just you being a motor racing fan that you wanted to be able to squeeze the greats and in, into your character's backstory or what what what, what made made you make him a racing driver before he was a cop um, a couple of things, really, because I wanted him to have, you know, social connections. Um, and if, you know, if you've come from a sort of bourgeois background in Germany, that kind of limits the, 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 the situation. If you're a celebrity, then, of course, you know, you, everybody wants to be your buddy. So that's going to open a lot of doors for him. And, you know, you could have made it a film star, but then, of course, everybody would recognise him wherever he went. You know, the fact that he's a motor racing person means that, you know, um, because they had hats and goggles on, yeah, you'd, you'd kind of the aficionados would... would uh, would know him on site, but uh, everybody else might know the name. And I thought that would be, um, you know, as I say, open a few doors for him socially, but at the same time, um, you know, you want something to sort of mark your character out. And, and I think one of the interesting, the things that have interested me in recent years is, you know, how do people cope with celebrity? You know, being an author, that's not a problem. It really isn't, you know? But if you're a film star or a sports star, or, you know, you're on, um, yeah, you know, even the weather person, you know, people know your face. And, you, you know, you go on to things like uh, Strictly Come Dancing and stuff like that. And, and there's this whole industry that sort of works around just that, you know, the recognition factor. One of the beauties, of course, is, you know, of writing, you know, you may sell millions of books in 20 different languages or whatever. But um, in my entire life, I've been recognised once. <laughs> <laughs> and that was in Spain in a town called Girona, which was really, really funny. Um, because uh, yeah, my editor had taken me there for lunch, and because um, I was going to talk at the university that afternoon, and um, this guy, because apparently this restaurant was popular with the academics at the university, and this guy came up and said, "Are you Simon Scarrow? Are you Simon Scarrow?" <laughs> so I have nerd recognition factor, yay! <laughs> the the second question was one that we did just before we started recording, and we wish we recorded it, so I'm going to ask it again. The I'm 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 a huge fan of the Philip Kerr Bernie Gunter books, mm -hmm. and I you know the 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 question I was asking you is, do you do you look at you know who else has written about this period, or do you just you know do you just dive in because you know the the Gunter books do have a bit of a of a of a long shadow in in this sort of thing. But for 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 you, was it stay away from them or or have have a look at the competition? Well, no, no, I mean, it, it's a kind of, you know, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because, you know, you know I'm not the first person to have written about Rome. I'm certainly not the first, the first person to have written about Napoleon and Wellington. Um, so, you know, you, you kind of, uh, you know, because somebody's done it before doesn't mean there's no reason why somebody else shouldn't have a crack at it, you know. And it's a bit like that whole thing to do with, um, um, you know, cultural appropriation. So it's, it's kind of, you know, historical appropriation. Nobody owns a particular era. So everything's open and up grabs as, as far as I, I can you know, see it. Uh, as far as the Bernie Gunter books, I was aware of them because a friend of mine's a big fan um, and he told me about them years before I even thought about writing a German detective series. And I'd kind of put it on my you know, back list of, you know, I must read that someday sort of thing. Um, but then I started writing it and then I have a very, very firm policy that if I'm writing about a particular uh, era or a particular uh, trope, you know, generic trope within a particular area, uh, then you, you 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 don't want to be reading anything that might influence your writing. You know, you do not want to pick up the the writing ticks of another writer, and and uh, because people will pick up on that. So that kind of meant that I couldn't read Philip Kerr. Um, uh, certainly not until I'd written at least one and or you know two books. And I have um, when I finished the first book, I did actually um, read the opening of the of one of Philip. I think because it's you know Berlin Noir. I think it's you know 
Digest of Freedom of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. So I started reading that. And it struck me, a couple of things struck me about it. Firstly, um, you know, it, it, one of the characteristics of, of Nazi Germany was the way that it forced people to kind of contain their personalities. Um, it forced them to contain their opinions to such a degree that you had no idea, however well you knew somebody, um, you might even be married to them, you know, that you really had no idea what they were really thinking because, you know, if there was an argument, they might be calculating, you know, well, will this person denounce me if we have an argument? So therefore, I better be careful about what I say here. So there's a lot of that that was going on. And one of the things that, um, and you'd be very, very careful what you said because certain things could get you into a lot of trouble, um, you, you know, to whoever you said it. So um, reading, it, it, you know, it felt to me that a third person um, narrative was by far the more realistic way to proceed because you know everybody's the third person in, in you know you don't really get to know people they are all surfaces um, but the problem of course with a third person first person narrative is that you get so sort of intimately involved with this person um, that just wouldn't be the case in Nazi Germany so it didn't feel kind of the right way to do it for me and certainly some of the things I'm not you know I know this guy's you know, hugely more successful than I'll ever be and um, and highly regarded and so on but it's a different perspective it's a different way of understanding um, how you're going to go about re representing this particular period and you know he was very much you know on the on the on the wavelength of doing Chandler in Berlin and I was you know very much more about kind of doing I suppose um, oh, what's that um, uh, prime suspect, you know, that kind of feel, procedural, um, you know, capture the zeitgeist uh, kind of novel. Um, so that's, I think, where how I, my series is going to be different from the Philip Kerr series. I need, I need to go and read Blackout. I haven't done yet because I have Metropolis, the last Gunther book, sat on the shelf, which I've never read because I want to save it for something. Mm. So I think you. this is going to sound terrible, but you're going to fill in fill in the gap for me there Simon. To push, push I'll live with that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about the latest book which is has come out within the, the last few days of us um, recording. So Honour of Rome, it's the latest installment of the Eagles of the Empire series. Obviously you don't want you to give any spoilers because that's the whole point of doing things like this, people go out and buy the book. But where does this sit within the context of that series? Because it is an epic series. It's what, book 20, 21 mm. now? No, 20, 20, yeah. XX. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, 20 books in, um, when we kicked this thing off, I thought 10, 12 books. My agent thought we'd be lucky we'd get away with six. And the publisher thought it was going to be three books and so on. So, you know, who knows anything about how these things would turn out. Um, but of course, you know, uh, I got, I developed Macro and Cato. Macro and Cato are like old buddies who sit in my head. And uh, when we get around to writing the Macro and Cato book each year, it's like going on holidays of old friends. And I'm little more than an amanuensis these days. You know, they take the story along, they decide what's going to happen, and I just get the words down. So that's kind of how that goes. Um, so I really don't know kind of how that each book is going to turn out. It's up to them to work that out, and I'm along for the ride. But um, it started off with um, the invasion, started off in Germania, where, you know, Cato joined in the, in the legions in the first book. And I really wanted to write about the invasion of Britain, but I wanted to totally get the, the reader on side with the Roman perspective before I let them get out there and start kicking the shit out of British people, you know, uh, uh, ancient versions. Because I thought, well, you know, they're invading Brit Britannia, Britain, and they're kicking, kicking the locals in. And you know, what's it like to be on the receiving end of imperialism? Mm -hmm. So that was very much kind of you know why Cato thinks about this from time to time, but probably slightly, I mean, it's not anachronistic. There were plenty of Romans who were thinking about uh, you know, the, the barbarian perspective and, and the, the, other, the other and so on. So it's not like there wouldn't be people like Cato around, but I just wanted to make, you know, very much foreground that. Okay, let's sort of identify the imperialists and then you know give them up, give the us a good kicking, and see how we kind of shimmer between those two perspectives. So that was the thinking behind that. And then, um, and Britannia has become a very, I mean, the twentieth book is set in a, as a return to Britannia, and we've been back a you know a, a couple of times. And it's an interesting one because what you've got there is a province um, uh, in the process of being you know provincialized um, because. 
the fighting's still going on. You know, this is, this is what, you know, actually Britain and Judea were the two toughest provinces for the Romans to keep a, a lid on. Um, and for very similar reasons, you know, the, the religion primarily, uh, and it was the Druids who kept stirring the shit up in, in Britain, and of course the, the rabbis and stuff in, in um, Judea. Um, so there was this, this kind of um, uh, interesting setting that you come back to from time to time to see wh how have things gone on. And this book, um, Macro thinks he's retired, so he's, he's left the army, um, and coming back to Britain in, in 59 AD, a year before a certain uh, Iceni queen decides that she's going to uh, cause a bit of trouble. So, you know, anybody who knows anything about the history can guess where things go from here. But at the same time, you know, Macro is coming back to uh, Londinium and it's been, you know, this, this town's been it's 10, 12 years old. Um, so it's pretty much a frontier town um, with very kind of lawless state of affairs and uh, an administration that's trying to keep, you know, ahead of, of the, of the uh, the criminals and um, uh, developments and so on was trying to run a province. Um, so, you know, it, it's kind of like, you know, uh, Baghdad post Iraq invasion on steroids, you know, it's that kind of uh, dodgy uh, people coming from Rome to make a fortune, um, take all the sort of funding and get out quick and, and people on the ground sort of wheeler dealer and you know, making all those sorts of um, uh, dodgy you know, deals to for their own advancement. And so, that's what kind of you know thematically what it's like as well as delivering the story of you know how macro thinks he's going to retire and goes up against these crime gangs um and uh yeah I mean, it's, it's one of the you know 20 books in you know there are going to be certain uh, people saying oh it's a bit formulaic but you know part of why i think the series has lasted as long as it is is because you know it is sensitive to what's going on in the present world and that does tend to make you know the stories differ from time to time. The previous novel was about a pandemic that breaks out in Sardinia. So, um, you know, that's, and uh, un whilst it's under the uh, uh, control of a, a rather ineffective narcissistic lying governor and his bald sidekick, you know, who knew? <laughs> I'm, I'm just looking at the sort of the dates here. You're sort of, what, five years away from the first, the first battle that first siege of Jerusalem that's I'm not wanting to try to guess where you're going to take the series but yeah one's just yeah way ahead of me <laughs> <laughs> so let's just dive in about Rome for a minute is you know the, the journey that they've got uh case of macro have, have had is is just it's been epic so far but you've only sort of touched in small areas is that a challenge when you're trying to move your characters through well, such a vast canvas can can you is there bits that you wish you could have delved into or that you still will and you haven't done and i'm trying to well, make you think about things that you haven't written yet yeah yeah well you know the thing is um when you look at uh, tombstones of roman soldiers <clears throat> quite often you'll see their service records there and there are plenty of them that you know say this person served in germania judea egypt blah 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 britannia so we know that the you know that the Roman soldiers got around. Some of them, of course, you know, were garrison soldiers entire lives in some peaceful little spot, and you know, good luck to them. But a lot of them, you know, probably the ones who had slightly more about them and were effective soldiers were the ones that were doing sort of you know the, the fire brigade actions, rushing around the empire to sort of where they were needed. Um, so it's quite you know credible that Cato and Macro uh, could have travelled as much as they have across the series. You know, it's been seventeen odd years now that. Um, in Roman time, the, the, the series has been running, and they've been to, you know, um, Egypt, Judea, Syria, um, Germania and Britannia, Sardinia and, and, and uh, Spain. So that's all kind of, you know, fairly doable, frankly. Um, but of course, you know, one of the, the things about research is that, you know, if I, if I, you know, for example, when I wrote Gladiator, I didn't, I had no idea I was going to write Gladiator, you know, but we went on holiday to Crete. Uh, to visit the only interesting member of my family, who's my cousin Hannah, who ran away when she was 16 to marry her Greek boyfriend in, in Crete. So I was catching up with her. And um, as we're driving through central Crete, you know, we're driving on, there's this road sign that says, remains of Roman town, slams the brakes on, you know. And of course, you know, this is the middle of the day and it's really, really hot. And uh, it's uh, the, the, this, this uh, ruins of this town called Cortina, which were destroyed by an earthquake in, I think, 47 
48, 47, 49 AD. And I thought, this is, oh, we've got to stop here and have a look. And so, of course, with my then wife and uh, two sons bitching about the heat and needing an ice cream, uh, I took them to the beach and left them and drove back and had a good look. And it occurred to me that, for, you know, this date that there was this earthquake which destroyed the city almost coincides with Macro and Cato coming back from Syria. So I thought, what if they were sailing past the island when the earthquake struck and the tsunami which wrecks their ship? And so they, you know, they land in, in Crete and then there's um, everything's gone to, to ship, you know, the, the infrastructure, everything. And there's a slave revolt. And uh, so, you know, in the space of about half an hour, I'd worked it all out. Um, for a book I was never going to write. And this is what frequently happens, you know, when you're doing the research into uh, Roman history or, you know, or some aspect of it. Inevitably, you know, at least three or four other projects suggest themselves. So, um, uh, you know, I'm going to be long dead before I get through about a quarter of the potential plots for Macro and Cato somewhere in the Roman Empire. I want to ask a bit about the, the span, because we, we've said, you know, you're 20 novels in which means that you know the the majority of your work has been on the roman period is that and this is kind of a chicken and egg scenario potentially but is this because you know you have a particular affinity and interest in that world which you talked about at the start or do you find the publishers sort of sit you down and go okay can we have another one of these kind of thing that means that you end up writing more because people are demanding more from you and so do you kind of have situations where you kind of go okay great i'm very happy to go back to this but i also want to explore other areas and have to sort of push back against that well, that's a good question um and um you know it, it's about you know like any aspect of of business which is you know what publishing is what writing is um you've got to think about st strategically um and you know the, all writers have to do this right from the beginning um one of the very first things that you have to, to you know, be sensible about is if you get a book contract is you don't give up the day job. Uh, my first agent was very, very clear about that. And she said, look, you know, it's not gonna be much. You, it may not work out. You'd be a loony to give up the teaching job. So, um, and then I spoke to Bernard Cornwall. Um, I, I did some literary event with him when the first book came out and was talking to him about this. And he said, yeah, absolutely. He said, you know, until you've written five books, a minimum of five books, I wouldn't even dream of, you know, giving up the day job. So that was, you know, step one. The other thing is that um, actually, again, it was, um, I mean, I'd, I'd thought of this before I, I was talking to Bernard about it. He said, it's really, really important to get an established series going um, because, um, you know, every book that you write will sell, the backlist will sell, and that will finance, you know, the possibilities of doing sort of other projects. Um, but you can't, you know, do the other projects without, you know, a firm basis. So the Macro and Cato series really became the, the kind of mortgage payer, if you like. Um, and then there are other projects like the Wellington Napoleon thing I was absolutely passionate about. And luckily that, 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 that did quite well. And then there are sort of one-off projects that, um, you know, you write which the publishers are, you know, there will be a, you know, they, they may or may not sell big, but they know that they will sell comfortably and they will pay you less for them, but at least you can write them. So I've written about um, the Siege of Malta in 1565, for example, and the German occupation of um, uh, um, uh, Lefkas in, in the Second World War. Um, so, you know, you can do that. And I also uh, managed to do a, a, a young adult series um, about a boy gladiator for Puffin. Um, and so as long as you've got a, you know, you diversify your product range you know, in, in the crudest kind of possible commercial terms. Um, and if you've got a, a brand macro and cater that works well, you, you continue the brand. And it's not like it's a problem to write macro and cater stories. You know, I'm going to be doing that until I drop off the twig. And yes, they will be in Jerusalem. Um, that is up there. And they will certainly be there for 69 AD when there's the year of the four emperors in the civil war. Um, so, you know, plot spoilers there. Guess the guys can't get hurt, you know. But um, it, it's, uh, you know, people, and the thing about, you know, the delight of doing something as long as 20 books for a series is you really do get a chance to get to know the characters and you get a chance to sort of follow them through all the various vicissitudes and challenges of a normal life, you know, rather than box it all up in one narrative. And, it, and they become bigger than the, um, the individual stories, really. And I think that's part of the attraction for the readers. It's not so much 
you know, who Macro and Cato are going to duff up this time. It's, you know, what happens in Macro and Cato's lives that they're interested in. They want to know, you know, serial and soap opera fashion, you know, what happens to the characters next. And I think, you know, as a writer, um, if you're going to be, if you want, to, you know, it's very, very difficult to make a, a living out of writing. Let's be honest about it. Um, the, the, the average salary is something like £12,000 a year of every writer. The average, oh, I didn't realise this statistic I heard the other day, the average number of books sold by um, uh, an author, you know, you know, author books, 400 copies. You know, you're not going to get rich or 400 copies. Um, so, you know, if you want to, if you're serious about making a, a living out of it, then you have to write frequently. You know, you have to do at least a book a year. And I think you'd be sensible if you wrote a series because then, you know, you've got a guaranteed market and uh, a body of readers who will follow the series. It will make it possible for you to do other things. Um, and, you know, I, 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 it seems fairly obvious, but I'm quite surprised by how many writers just seem to think that, you know, you can just write what, you know, what suits you at a particular time. And, and you know, also you've got to be fairly kind of disciplined about this. I'm not disciplined. I mean, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I, I just lost time researching and then panic and write, you know, the books that, when the editor phone gives me the phone call. Um, there are authors I know who sort of religiously get up every morning and write 2,000 words and then get on with the rest of their day. And I envy them. Um, but equally, you know, you've got to be, you, know, you can't be too precious about it. I, I remember coming across a writer who had got a six-figure deal for three books coming straight out of university. Now, that's, that's pretty rare. And her career died because basically she spent three years submitting the second book um, two years too late. And I was talking to her about it. And I said, so, you know, what's your writing day like? And she said, um, oh, I, I do two, 250 words a day. And, um, and I thought, you know, how the hell are you ever going to get anything written? And I said, well, what about editing? She said, oh, no, I don't edit. When I've written those 250 words, they're perfect. And you're just thinking, you know, that's insane. Um, and, you know, she ended up becoming a creative writing tutor at a university, who would have guessed, you know, and so her career is now going to be, you know, small books with big words in small print and low sales. That, that, that's basically what she's condemned herself to. And if she's happy doing that, good luck to her. But, you know, I always wanted to make a living out of it. You know, I didn't want it to be some sort of mildly pleasing hobby that put a bit of jam on the toast. You know, I wanted it to be the thing that actually, you know, paid me to do some traveling and, um, you know, go scuba diving and stuff like that. So there's your hot tip. Do a, do a series, keep it going. Yeah, don't give up the day job. Oh, but I want to give up the day job. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 love, I love what you said there about your characters. You said just join them on the ride. Because I remember George McDonald Fraser saying something similar about Flashman. He, he, didn't, he didn't like him, didn't like spending time with him. And the quicker the journey was over, the better. But he kept having to come back to him because it was, well, the series, but it was, it, it was that familiarity with them that you, you sort of subconsciously know what they're going to do and it, 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 it works out. Well, some people are just horribly, horribly fascinating, aren't they? I mean, you know, you know nobody wants to go to have dinner with Hannibal Lecter because we know how that's going to turn out. But equally, we want to be, make sure he's safely behind bars when we have a conversation with him because he's so funny and entertaining and, you know, um, and quite sort of chilling. Um, but yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, it, but luckily with Macro and Cato, as I said, it's an unalloyed pleasure, you know, to sit down and um, you know go through the adventures with them because they're just you know very very entertaining guys. And I think partly that's down to uh, talk about narcissism again. Uh, I think my my fifth, my oldest son sort of worked it out pretty early on. He said, yeah, yeah. He said, you know, it's obvious, Dad. You know, Cato is how you used to be when you were a student. I thought, yeah, it's true, it's true. He said, Macro is what you've grown up to become. And he, he's right. You know? <laughs> That's why Let, I get on with them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's turn this around again. Do you have a red list of things that you won't touch? So, you know, periods of things that you just think, wow, that's going to be more trouble than it's worth. No, I don't have a, you know, a you know, red list on anything. It's actually the, the situation isn't the writers, it's the publishers. They have a red list, you know. Um, so, for example, it's really, really hard to get a successful novel out of the English Civil War. Why? 
I mean, it is bloody interesting stuff that's going on there. You know, I came up with a, an idea for a, a novel set then about the levelers and the diggers, because I thought, you know, here's a, you know, a, a moment in history where things could have gone very, very differently, you know. And, um, and she said, yeah, but who's going to read that? And I thought, well, you know, it's important. And she said, yeah, but it's not commercial. And I think that that's how publishers tend to work. Rome is commercial. You know, Wars of the Roses, commercial, you know. Napoleonic Wars, commercial, English Civil War. Tudors. Yeah, Tudors, yeah. Um, some of the East Africa imperialist stories, no, not so good. You know, and so it goes. Um, Dark Ages, yes, because you can play about with a bit of mythology there. Um, but, you know, ancient Stone Age, you know, once in a while, not, not a lot going on there apart from people hitting each other with clubs and hauling stones about. You know, it, it's so publishers are looking for. Um, and of course, it's like the film industry. Everybody sort of says, yeah, we're looking for something new and fresh and interesting. They're not. They're looking for the new Marvel movie. You know, that's kind of how it works. And it's the same with publishing. You know, when um, Fifty Shades of Grey came out, I kid you not, one of the first books out of the stables from my own publisher called Sixty Shades of Blue. You know, that's that's how they work. OK, um, so don't be, uh, you know, What's important, I think, is not coming up with an original idea. It's coming up with a distinctive voice. It's coming up with, you know, interesting characters. It doesn't matter if, you know, the setting is as hackneyed as anything. As long as you offer something slightly refreshing, you know, or do something in a slightly different way within a period that the, you know, you know publishers think is a sort of sexy uh, commercial prospect, then you're away. You know, it's a fool's game to sort of think, OK, well, I'm really, really interested in the levelers and the diggers. And I'm going to, you know, and everybody else will be, of course, because, you know, this all, this failed transformative moment in British history. Of course, everybody's going to be interested. You know, no, they're not. Um, and certainly from a commercial perspective, the number of um, copies of books that are going to be sold about your levelers and diggers novel, you know, are going to be smaller than your shoe size, frankly. That's the way it works. I have visions off the back of your Sixty Shades of Blue anecdote that you know your publicist is going to turn around to you and go, so how about writing, you know, 10,000 Shades of Red about a uh, oh. bizarre... <laughs> somebody, somebody asked that question at the Literary Festival and said, you know, are any of your books, you know, would you have done anything differently? And I said, yeah, I'd have called my first book Fifty Shades of Crimson. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, that, that's what happens. It's like, you know, when, you remember when the Da Vinci Code came out? Yeah. Then there was the Mozart Codex. There was the Benini Conundrum and, you know, all these kinds of books that were coming out with these fairly kind of soft focus pictures of archways of people running through them in sort of dark shadowy covers and stuff. Yeah, you know, that, that's what happens all the time. Um, and of course, you get these things with publishers, you know, I mean, they do my head in. I came up with an idea for a vampire novel, um, um, which I think would have been really, really good, actually. And, uh, you know, we took it to... Um, uh, something I was going to co-write with my brother and we took it to his publisher and he said oh you know vampires pff, that's yesterday's stuff nobody's going to be writing about vampires again day you know a few months later Stephanie Mayer you know that's the way it goes vampires are always going to be in vogue you know because what is it they do it's aristocrats sucking the blood of workers what changes you know the vampires these days are likely to be Zuckerberg and you know uh, baldy guy Bezos and you know um, and it's a similar sort of motif that's still running. You know? So I think that kind of analogy, that kind of metaphor for that exploitation that vampires embody, you know, ain't going away anytime soon. Werewolves less so, because you know, werewolves are all about you know, uh, unleashing male sexuality and stuff. And in a, in a world where we're kind of trying to tamper down on that, I, mean, I think werewolves have got to, you know, they're going to have their fur and legs trimmed a bit. Um, you know, what else have we got? Zombies? Well, yeah. yeah. Ooh, don't, don't, social, don't. You start social media. Business, social media. Yeah. That's it. The recipients of social media. Yeah. There's your zombie story. Yeah. No, no, no. So, I'm, I'm a big zombie fan. I don't, yeah. Don't, it's, well, you know. Be, to be fair, one of my favorite, I, I don't particularly like vampires, but Max Brook did a fantastic graphic novel of putting himself in amongst the vampires in a zombie apocalypse. So food <laughs> source is dying out. Yeah, that yeah. So we, we, we digress, but zombie, no, don't you start the zombie. That's <laughs> well, a break, they're a genre break, that must break, continue yeah. as long as they are slow and George Romero esque. That's, that's yeah. the rules. Make America great. <laughs> exactly. 
so you, you mentioned you've been you've been spotted once really mm. <laughs> which which i think is terrible yeah this has been fantastic oh, God, no, and, no, and no. everyone should watch this you can now that you've been on our podcast we're going to put you on our yeah. youtube channel you're going to be seen everywhere I promise yeah but you know, when i take the mask off i'm going to be Oh, yeah, you know, we, we were talking about some of the fun lessons you, you, you received earlier about names and things like that. Do, do you have any of, of those sort of moments you want to share that just sort of make this sort of tick, tickle you when you look back? On Are you it? talking about the embarrassments we talked about before the recording or? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had this guy write to me and say, Scarrow, you dickhead. Didn't you know, before he was the Duke of Wellington, everybody knows his name was Arthur Wel Wellesley. So why are you calling Arthur Wellesley, idiot? So, uh, you know, basically five seconds on Wikipedia would have sorted that query out. I mean, bless the guy, he's, he's written a letter, you know, he sat down and penned it by hand. He's gone to the post office, he paid for the stamp, put it on the thing and sent it to, to my publisher who then sends it on to me. And he could have saved himself all of that effort if he'd gone to Wikipedia and discovered that the, the family was originally called the Wesleys. But when Richard, his older brother, inherited the title, he didn't want them to be confused with that awful hymn-composing family, with those sort of dirges that the Wesleys came up with. So he sort of said, no, 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 we're going, we're going back to an earlier version of the name that they hadn't used for sort of three centuries. So, um, you know, that happens. And yes, it's very satisfying. But once in a while, I mean, I, mean, I have made some absolute howlers, I, I'll be honest. Um, and partly, is this, this is, I, I tend to get the story out quickly and then go back and read over things, but I was a bit rushed one year and, um, and I was talking about some uh, Roman officer in some fort in, um, in sort of on the borders of Judea, um, you know, pining for uh, the comforts of Italy and growing his tomatoes. And of course, tomatoes came from South America. Um, so, <laughs> mea culpa. So obviously the hardback version has that in the paperback version, we fixed it and turned it into, I think it was aubergines, but, uh, but you know, it, it, it's one of those things. Um, for some reason, you know, it's easily done. Italians, tomatoes, of course they go together. Um, and uh, that's, that's I kind of blew it on that one. But um, yeah, and I, and I, you know, rightly got a caning from you know, a few readers uh, who picked that up, but again, surprisingly few. Um, but now I know all about tomatoes as a result of that. So there's always a, you know, an upside. So that's a very long answer to a very straightforward question. Apologies. It was a, it was a very good answer. It, it, I was just thinking it's, it's like the apples in Ben Hur that people complain about because they, they wouldn't have had apples in in, in mm. that in the bowl of fruit in Marcellus and Marcellus and the side. Um, they wouldn't have had wristwatches either. Well, uh, you, you like to know what your lap time is, don't you? So yeah, well, yeah, that, that's true. I suppose you know they could have. Um, Easy enough to do, isn't it? You just kind of get the thing and strap it on and that and that. And, exactly. Oh, time is. Uh... I'm sure that's a gag in history of the world, part one. I'm sure. <laughs> um, what's next? Ah, uh, well, I'm at the moment. I'm halfway through the next German book, uh, Schenker, um, and this is, um, you know, it's still winter. It's 1940, and uh, he's looking into some sort of um, potential the, the murder of a doctor and the potential murders of some children and uh, how they're connected. So I won't say more about it now. So there's that. And then I've got um, the, 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 the Roman book that's just come out ends on the eve of the Boudican revolt. So it's possible we may be covering that in the next two books. Um, and then I'm working on a co-book with, um, co-written book with TJ uh, Andrews on um, another character from the, because we tend to pick on characters you know, who've been really, really interesting in, in this main series and then spin off and do their story. So we're doing another a two book um, thing on that, which I'm really excited by because it's about um, some character writing, a Roman historian writing the, um, the life story of a character, uh, of a Roman historical character. And so it's that interplay between them about what this guy actually wants known and what this guy wants to tell as the truth and at the same time wants to sell. So it's all about those kind of, um, processes that go into writing hagiographies and uh, what's true, what's not, and why is it that way? You know, so that that's going to be really interesting. Um, other than that, um, yeah, I've, you know, I've got to get ready for Christmas and uh, uh, and then possibly a move to another country. So you know, it was uh, mm -hmm. I fancy a bit of a change of scene. So um, 
winter will do that to you. And then amongst all of that, no doubt, some skiing and scuba diving to boot. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> Funnily enough. <laughs> Simon, you've been incredibly generous with your time. Thank you so much for joining us on History Hack. Folks, go online. All you've got to do is Google this guy, Simon Scarrow. You'll find the wealth of novels. Um, Boney, I'm sure you'll put the, the books on our History Hack bookstores so that people can just click the link and it'll be as simple as that. I think we, we, we will we'll put a selection because if we put all of them on there, it will basically be the History Hack Simon Scarrow. Thanks, this, this is true but not not that's say, a bad thing for simon i don't think yeah. can i just say this has been actually one of the you know i think it's probably been the most entertaining and fun um and certainly some of the best questions you know of uh, any of these things that i've done for years now so um oh, thank, thank you, you very much, much for, the, the, for the entertainment well thank you it, it's just to say it's all zach's hard work i just show up and steal it glory. <laughs> Yeah, no, but we've, it's been a great, you know, been a great blast actually talking to you guys. So thank you for inviting me. Thank, seriously, thank you for joining us. It's been great. Uh, oh, I'm doing the recording, so I have to hit yeah, stop. Yeah, you've got to stop it. We'll leave that bit in. We'll leave that in just to show yes, you were in contact. We'll have, have, have the love in and then realise, <laughs> actually, we screwed all this up. Folks, before you go, do me a favour. Like the episode and hit the subscribe button. It'll take you two seconds, but it really helps us to spread the work that we do. You can also leave a comment. We'd love your feedback on the episode, what you liked, and let us know whether you want more of this kind of stuff. If you want it, we're happy to do our best to try and provide it. Obviously, all episodes, and particularly bigger projects like this, take a huge investment of time and resources. If you are able to help us cover the costs so that we can grow and expand our content, you can become a regular supporter via Patreon. That's not for everyone, though. So if you want to leave a one-off tip, you can do that via Ko-fi. All the links you need are in the description. And also don't forget that we have a merchandise shop. Boney has put loads of great things together for you. So take a look. Again, the link is in the description. Check out the History Hack bookstore and effectively treat yourself or the History Hack fan in your life. We'll be back in a couple of days. Take care, folks. History Hack out.